Tipping the scales, inflation overpowers growth. I think this is really the best way to summarize what we've seen this past week on the economic calendar. We're going to take you through step by step the big numbers that were released, uh, the implications of the financial markets and future Federal Reserve decisions. Today, on a year over year basis, the personal consumption expenditure, PCE, that's a measure of inflation, was reported. We stayed steady at 2.7%, matching the prior uh, month's report on, again, over on a year-over-year basis. So inflation did not go down. We are hoping it would, but it did not go up either. Uh, core PC, excluding food and energy, the more volatile components of the inflation measure, uh, stayed steady also 2.8%. Fractionally, it's actually just a hair below 28 but for all intents and purposes, uh, this measure did not move. So this is not really big news. Again, it would have been nice if it went down, but it did not. Uh, the impact to the Fed funds futures, we can see uh, in the July meeting, there was very minimal reaction. But in terms of the probability of a rate cut in September, it went up another three percentage points. Uh, the probability of no cut went down three percentage points. Again, September is really the pivot point uh, that we're looking at as far as the Federal Reserve to make a decision or to make a decision to cut rates, we should say. Now, this overall, this is a probability of a Fed cut, and this is only for the September meeting. And we can see how this has changed over time. Just in the past couple of days, the probability that the Federal Reserve will cut rates in September have gone up from 48 to now a current 54%. Uh, it's the first time it's above 50% in well, about a couple weeks or so. Uh, it is significant because this does tell us that while inflation literally is not budging, growth is falling. And the perception is, at least according to the market, that we're going to need an interest rate cut soon. Again, not because inflation is coming down. It's not because growth is coming down. Let's get to the bond market. The bond market usually gives us the best insight. The blue bars represent today's daily change in the treasuries. Uh, the yellow is a monthly change. The red is the weekly change. And the big moves have been today the daily change to the downside, uh, specifically in the medium term maturities, the two, five, and 10 year, also 30 to a lesser extent. Uh, and what this is showing us, now the bond market moves down in anticipation to long-term yields, like the 10-year, move down in anticipation of future economic growth or lack thereof. The short-term yields move in anticipation of interest rate decisions. So the long-term yields are coming down the same way we see the Fed funds futures, the probability of a Fed cut that has gone up. Well, as that has gone up, the perception is... It's the same perception. We're going to need an interest rate cut sooner rather than later because, again, the data has been so soft. Taking a look at a long-term chart, this goes back to August of last year. Every line represents a different maturity from the three-month all the way to the 30-year. Let's focus specifically on two, though. The red line, that's the one-year bond. And the white line, that's the 10-year. Again, short-term rates like the one-year move in anticipation the Federal Reserve is going to raise or lower interest rates. Long-term yields move in anticipation that the economy is getting better. If the economy is getting better, we see the rates go up as they have since January. But let's focus in specifically uh, between last couple months, we should say. What we're looking at here, left-hand side, what's highlighted is the 10-year bond yield uh, between late March, really the beginning of April, through around April 19th, through the first three weeks in April, the 10-year bond yield the 10 year bond yield rally quite a bit. Right hand side, S&P 500, same highlighted uh, the highlighted positions the same period of time, stock market sold off, you know, those of you watching, I'm sure you remember that this was a quite quite hefty sell off so to speak. Now, what's going on here? What's going on here is that the data at the time was actually looking a little bit better. And specifically, if you recall, Manufacturing numbers started to look a little better. Empire State, uh, the, the Philly Fed, also I believe retail sales were starting to improve. This was around April. 
And as a result of that stronger economic data, the market, meaning all of us, the participants, when we say market, it just means us reacting to the data, the, those of us buying and selling stocks and bonds. Well, the market react and say, hey, the data is looking a little bit better. Maybe the Federal Reserve doesn't have to cut interest rates. Well, those of us investing in stocks said, uh-oh, that's not good. Stocks don't like high interest rates. High interest rates slow down growth. They slow down computer sales and auto production. So the stock market sold off. Now, I know we're in the middle of earnings season as well, and that does play a role. Uh, but in the grand macro picture, we're looking at the sell-off in stocks in anticipation the Fed would not cut rates. And we can see an improvement, obviously, in the perception of the economy. Now, following that period of time from late April through May, all of a sudden, the 10-year bond started to sell off once again, left-hand side of the chart. On the right-hand side, S&P 500 rallied. It was the opposite perception. The data started to get weak again. If you recall, uh, that was when we had, in that period of time, the non-farm payrolls, 175,000 jobs. Uh, you know, The inflation wasn't budging. The data turned back to the weak side. As we turned back to the weak side, the anticipation, left-hand side, the 10-year bond yield sold off. What's in our future? Probably not such a good economy. Right-hand side, the stock market in the short term says, that's great. We may see fewer, uh, lower interest rates sooner rather than later. Well, now we see just in the past couple trading days, stocks have been weak. Stocks have been weak and the 10-year bond has sold off. I don't expect this convergence. Convergence is when we have two markets going in the same direction. Usually we see lately a divergence between the two. I don't expect this convergence to continue where the 10-year bond is selling off at the same time the stock market is selling off unless we've reached a new pivot point. The pivot point that I think eventually we're going to get to and we're going to talk about this in the future is that later on in the cycle, Stocks will sell off and the 10-year bond yield will sell off at the same time. If we enter, if the door opens for what we could anticipate a recession. A recession occurs when a lot of things go down at the same time. 10-year bond yields go down. Stocks go down. Even commodities go down. Everything goes down because everyone is scared and everybody runs into money, runs into cash. So, that occurs when both stocks and bond yields go down. I don't, personal opinion, I don't think we're at that point yet. I think eventually if the stock market continues lower, we'll, still, we'll still see yields start to rally. Why hasn't the stock market been stronger uh, upon receipt of our weak data? Well, maybe that's because inflation is still high and the data actually has been mixed. The data we're talking about this week Specifically, GDP and the Beige Book, that was weak. But we also had consumer confidence. And that really, for some reason, had an effect on the markets. Now, left-hand side, white line, that's a 10-year bond. Uh, right, uh, red line is the one year. On the right-hand side, these are, again, the daily changes. So you can see, getting into the details, what happened today. The right-hand side is what happened today. What happened today, the 10-year bond really sold off uh, compared to all the other maturities, uh, five as well. And that is an anticipation that the future economic conditions really don't look so hot. This week's economic calendar, again, we had the Case-Shiller, S&P Case-Shiller Home Price Index, uh, the Fed's Beige Book, Gross Domestic Product, and today to the PCE, Personal Consumption Expenditure. Let's sum this up. Uh, if it was green, it means it was a good number. I don't think there's any good numbers out there. Orange in the middle, red is negative. S&P Shiller Home Price Index, no, the headline was good. We hit really nice highs. But if you look behind the data, uh, there's actually something else going on here. Uh, we spoke about it in the past, uh, earlier this week. Uh, it's actually a pretty interesting take, I think, that where you look at the surging uh prices as a result of dry inventory. The Fed's Beige Book gave us an inside look into the economy, anticipation of what the Fed may decide, uh, and most of that was weak. GDP, 1.3%, nothing to celebrate at all. And then today's PCE, 2.7%, nothing to celebrate either.
Next week's economic calendar certainly will prove to be important. Construction spending, factory uh, orders, ADP employment, wholesale inventory, and of course, a very, very big jobs number. Uh, in particular, the construction spending, factory orders, those are, and also I guess wholesale inventories, those are forward-looking indicators. So if we see those pop up, it may give us some hope. Certainly a lot to look forward to. By the way, and we mentioned this uh, before, earlier this week we spoke about the housing market. It's fiery on one side and very cool on the other. The fact of the matter is the S&P Case-Shiller Home Price Index went up a lot as a result of very few sellers. The sellers are locked in because of the high interest rates. Uh, so like we said, the home prices are rising, but for all the wrong reasons. And I think that you'll find it quite interesting uh, what we discussed here as well.